In this installment, we're going to explore the future of brands, where it's all headed, as to how brands will function in our lives and what it means for us as designers over the next 100 years. This three-part series entitled The 22nd Century Brand is brought to you by Design Singapore, the national agency for design, enabling Singapore to use design for economic growth and to improve lives. In these discussions, we will be looking at the origin of brands, how brands function in our contemporary cultural landscape, and the future of brands, where it's all headed. My name is Hunter Tura. I'm the founder and CEO of an international brand design consultancy called Syndicate X. Over the past 25 years, I've had the opportunity to work with some of the world's leading organizations across culture, commerce, and technology. And I've helped them develop clear brand stories, and I've helped them articulate their value proposition. I've worked with multinational corporations such as Netflix, Nike, GE, Unilever, Lululemon, Audi, and Asics to some of the world's leading museums and cultural institutions, including the Victoria and Albert Museum and the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. Through these collaborative partnerships, I've had the opportunity to see how brands really work and to witness the power they have in our collective consciousness. In our first discussion, we looked at the origin of brands, tracing their cultural meaning from the Roman Empire through the advent of the 21st century. Then we looked at brands today and the shift that has taken place to make brands themselves the platform for participation and exchange. In this installment, we're going to explore the future of brands, where it's all headed, and look at some recent case studies and begin to give us some insights as to how brands will function in our lives and what it means for us as designers over the next 100 years. So let's start with a question. Where are brands going? And how will they be different, especially after COVID-19? Well, there are many uncertainties in a post-COVID-19 world. There are certain trends in our recent history that begin to indicate an exciting future. If the brands of today are participatory, it seems we now have the opportunity to create brands that are responsive. And the brand itself can allow users to help drive the image, values, and reputation of an organization. In the 20th century, singular artists control the image of brands. More recently, the tools of brand design were made democratic and put in the hands of the people. Today, brands themselves are driven by our input and can change according to how we interact with that brand. One of my favorite examples of a project that I've worked on is 2012's No Canada. And it's a project that might begin to suggest how brands can grow and thrive and indeed become more visually rich and sophisticated with the increased participation of users. This is a project I helped lead when I was the CEO of Bruce Mao Design and represents a team effort of an incredibly talented group of global designers. But it's more than that. It also represents the input and action of thousands of users worldwide. That's me in 2012, launching the No Canada Project, the studios of WNYC Radio in New York City. Our team was asked to develop a brand campaign to educate an American audience about Canada in the 21st century. In our initial research, we determined that in spite of the fact that Canada was the most heavily branded nation on Earth, it still had an image problem, especially in the United States. 
Indeed, Canada, like many multinational corporations, has identity standards, or what we might call brand guidelines, which govern the usage of the brand of Canada. These standards are incredibly thorough. They establish the do's and don'ts of the Government of Canada wordmark, brand system, and language. They establish the hierarchy, organization of official government agencies in both English and in French. Even rules for effective communication, which in effect are the diplomatic voice of Canada, both at home and abroad. But somehow, in spite of this nearly obsessive level of control over Canada's visual expression, we found there was still not an identifiable brand for the country. As part of our research, we interviewed some of the key stakeholders of 21st century Canada, including the author and artist Douglas Copeland. He shared with us an amazing formulation when he said, Canada doesn't need a redesign. I like us just the way we are. This was a massive breakthrough for our team on this project and began to change the way I thought about the design of brands for my other clients. Instead of simply trying to create a new image or icon, we just tried to showcase what was already there. We went through an editorial process. We started with the most identifiable international image of Canada, the national flag that was adopted in the 1960s. We then removed the maple leaf and then used the remaining red bars to frame everything that we felt was fun, innovative, exciting, and beautiful about Canada in the 21st century. We called the campaign No Canada an invitation to learn more about this remarkable place. We made this short film to launch the campaign. And then designed the entire brand system. How No Canada should appear in print, urban environments as advertising in events and even pop-up installations in major cities. How No Canada could work in diplomatic quarters or even simply as a retail brand. It was a pretty remarkable time. No Canada launched on Canada Day, July 1st, 2012. And within the first 24 hours, it went viral. In the next couple of days, it was all over the news and social media. People, especially young Canadians, loved it. You can see some of the tweets and the positive response that we got to this design work. We loved it too. It won awards. It allowed me to lecture all over the world, including at the National Design Center in Singapore. And I was able to become something of an expert on branding the 21st century nation. But once the campaign was over, we were at a bit of a loss. What should we do with this brand? People loved it and it created an open and democratic image of Canada in the 21st century. We simply decided to make an app that would allow everyone to create an image of the brand of Canada. We then gathered all of the user-generated content onto a gallery website, and soon this gallery of images formed a popular image of the country. We actually put the brand of the nation into the hands of the people. You can see some of the work that was submitted there are certain recurring themes. And of course, Canadians tried again and again to replace the missing maple leaf. 
with other maple leafs that they found in their everyday lives. This project represented a huge shift in my thinking about design and the contemporary brand and where brands are going in the future. By making a brand open, democratic, and participatory, I could now see a corresponding increase in engagement. And as I began to think about that for consumer brands, it was not hard to imagine increased sales, deeper affiliation for companies and organizations with their key target audiences. More recently, I've been intrigued by a brand called Depop. It's a fashion platform that has created a community marketplace that allows designers, makers, and shoppers to express their own individuality. The more users who participate, the richer the experience becomes. To my mind, a brand like Depop begins to represent the future of how brands that create like-minded communities can begin to control the marketplace of the next decades. Whereas the old model was that a logo stood for the reputation of a brand, today the reputation actually stands before the logo. And we're moving back towards a place where there are authentic relationships and conversations between brands and customers. Value is once again replacing artifice. An image is being displaced by action. And the authentic purpose and the fundamental mission of an organization is once again a differentiator. Those brands that are founded on principle and driven by great design are far more likely to create the deep emotional connections that keep their customers coming back. And not surprisingly, that has led to increased awareness, deeper affiliation, and ultimately a growth in sales. In this context, the role of the designer has shifted again. Today, the designer is more of an impresario, bringing together the right people and opportunities, synthesizing the various inputs that are responsive to changing cultural and economic conditions. The impresario, in historical terms, is someone who puts on a show. And in the world of contemporary brand design, it's all about bringing the right people and projects together. When I started our brand design consultancy syndicate, I started with the radical proposition that I only wanted to work with the people I love and trust and work on those projects where we felt a deep connection to the mission of our clients. I feel this authentic alignment between design principles and corporate mission is one of the dynamics that is leading to more responsive and ultimately responsible brands. And ideally, it leads to work that is more efficient, of a higher quality, more sustainable. This all leads to more impactful results for organizations and the customers that they serve. To me, this is an incredibly exciting moment for both designers and for brands. Brands can do more and communicate more directly with their clientele than ever before. Brands can get immediate feedback which allows them to customize their image, messaging, and create opportunities that are specific and personal. They can literally respond to the needs of their customers. And while we have seen there are many unknowns for the world of design, it will be defined by the creative thinkers who can flow seamlessly between disciplines and understand global business trends, technology, and culture but mostly it belongs to those who stay true to the mission.